We have the colonia. What is the colonia for uh, for uh, Al-Gamimi in his uh, The Colonizer and the Colonized, first published in 1956. So the colonia for him is a European living in a colony but having no privileges, whose living conditions are no higher than those higher, sorry, the, uh, than those of a colonized person of equivalent economic and social status. By temperament or ethical conviction, a colonial is a benevolent European who does not have the colonizer's attitude towards the colonized. A, col a colonial self-defined does not exist for all Europeans in the colonies are privileged. I quote from his, uh, from Albert Smith's The Colonizer and the Colonized, he says, whether he expressly wishes it or not, he is received as a privileged person. He speaks about the colonizer. By the institutions, customs and people, from the time he learns or is born, he finds himself in a factual position which is common to all Europeans living in a colony, a position which turns him into a colonizer. So the first definition, which is the colonial, it for Albert Mimi, the colonial doesn't exist because the colonial is someone who is uh, who has no privilege and uh, who has uh, no uh, benefit in the, col in the colony and this, as he says, it doesn't exist because all those who come, or who come to a colony there is always privilege and there is always profit they are always searching for uh, more profit and searching for privileges you have the Yes, you have the second definition, which is the colonizer. Three factors typify the colonizer for Albert Mimi. The colonizer means me in a European in a colony. So the three uh, the three factors are profit, privilege, and usurpation. Okay, if we start with profit, why it's only us to European living in the colonies? What general general reasons induced him to expatriate, and what particular forces made him persist in his exile? When I mentioned adventure, the picturesque surroundings or the change of environment, the challenge involved in moving to the colony must first of all bring a substantial profit. So, for the colonizer, what is a colony for a colonizer? Okay, a colony as, okay, as defined by Albert Mimi, a place where one earns more and spends less. You go to a colony because jobs are guaranteed, wages high, careers more rapid, and business more profitable. The young graduate is offered a position, the public servant a higher rank, the businessman sub substantially lower taxes, the industrialist raw materials and labor at attractive prices. We have the second factor, which is privilege. What is privilege? So the colonizer realizes that the easy profit is so great only because it is wasted from others. He finds two things in one. He discovers the existence of the colonizer as he discovers, uh, sorry, his, uh, as he discovers his own privilege. He must constant, constantly live in relation to them. This relationship, which is lucrative, is what creates privilege. He finds himself on side of the scale, the other side of which is the colonized man. I quote. If these living conditions or standards are high, it's because those of the colonized are low. If he can benefit from plentiful and demanding labor and servants, it's because the colonized can be exploited at will and are not protected by the laws of the colony. And if he can easily obtain administrative positions, it is because they are reserved for him and the colonized are excluded from them. So the second one is privilege. The third one is usurpation. Okay? It is impossible for the colonizer to not to be aware of the constant illegitimacy of his status. This illegitimacy is a double one. How? A pioneer, having come to an end by the accident of history, he has succeeded not merely in creating a place for himself, but also in taking away that of the inhabitants, which means the colonized. He thus appears doubly unjust. He is a privileged person being an illegitimately, uh, 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 sorry, privileged one that is a uh, usurper. So, for Albert Mimi, this is the colonizer. A co a colon uh, for uh, colonizer, okay, we have three factors. We have privilege, we have usurpation, but also we have profit. 
these factors they define what who is the colonizer. So for the colonizer, we have two, okay, we have two uh, sorts or two uh, uh, two colonizers, if we can say so. So according to Albert, we mean we have the colonizer who refuses. So we distinguish we distinguish between two types of colonizers. One of them is the colonizer who refuses, and the other one is the colonizer who accepts. So what is the difference between that? Uh, okay, bearing in mind that both of them are colonizers. So if we start with the colonizer who refuses, so at the core of the colonizer uh, is his privilege, as uh, we have said. Some individuals born or traveling to the colonies felt overt guilt for this privilege. At first, they deny such privilege, but when it is in their face, daily it can no longer be ignored. At this point, they try to resist, but to do so would be to give up their privilege. To refuse okay, the status of the colonizer or to refuse this, the colonization means to Either, I quote from Abbot Mimi, either withdraw physically from the colonial condition, which means to, uh, to go back to the native or the homeland, or remain there to fight to change them. The choice to stay and fight puts the colonizer into a life of contradiction. He is now at odds with his countrymen, and cannot easily escape mentally from the concrete situations and ideology that make up the actual relationships of the colony. This contradiction de deprives him of all coherence and tranquility of his identity. So he lives in a dilemma. The attitude of his followers. First, with ironical indulgence, the hit must leave him. So they insist that this uh, must leave him. The insist for humanitarian romanticism is looked upon in the colonies as a serious kindness, the worst of all dangers. So for the colonizer who refuses, okay, his countrymen say that he, that he is plagued with what we call humanitarian romanticism. It's no longer more or less than going over to the side of the enemy. Humanitarian romanticism, it means that he has uh, an affection, or an, if uh, we can say so, uh, towards the status or the plight of the colonized. He felt uh, guilty over his privilege and he seems uh, sympathized with the, uh, the, I mean, with the colonized. <laughs> Second, if he persists, he will learn that he is launching into a declared conflict with his own people. He will be considered nothing but a traitor. His friends will transform, become surely, which means rude. His superiors will threaten him, even his wife will join and cry. Then you have the colonizer who refuses, finds it one thing to refuse colonization, but it is another, quite another to adopt or accept the colonized. And the adopted and accepted way by that. For the two are far from being connected. Who can completely rid of himself of bigotry in the country and system founded on such principle? No matter how genuine he is, there remains a fundamental difference between himself and the colonizer. The colonizer can only reject being identified in any way with the colonized. In other words, either he no longer recognizes himself, uh, sorry, the colonized, or he no longer recognizes himself. In resisting, he is aiding Okay, the birth of a social order, order, order sorry, which may no longer have a place for him. So, he dreams of a new social order in which the colonized stop being colonized, but he does not see a transformation of his own situation and identity. In the new harmonious social order, he will continue being who he is, with his language, intact, and his cultural traditions dominating because though he hates the operation of the colonization, he too buys the theories of social evolution. In other words, in other words, he hopes to continue his identity within the abstract concept of the dominate culture, with a situation where the dominate culture would not, would, uh, would not exist. He calls for a revolution, but refuses to conceive that this revolution 
would result in the overthrow of his situation and identity. In short, the benevolent colonizer or the colonizer who refused colonization does not find solution to his ambiguity. He will end up either in remaining silent or in leaving the colony. So, we have another colonizer, type of colonizer, who is the colonizer who accepts. Okay, so, even at the beginning I have said that Albert Mimir made a distinction between three colonial entities. We have the colonial, the colonizer, and the colonialist. Who is a colonialist for Albert Mimir? A colonialist is the colonizer who agrees to be a colonizer. Okay, this is the definition of Albert Mimir for a colonialist. To be a colonialist is the natural vocation of the colonizer. By making his position explicit, he seems to legitimize colonization. I quote from his, okay, from his essay. No matter what happens, he justifies everything, the system and the officials in it. He obstinately pretends to have seen not enough of poverty and justice and injustice work which are right under his nose. He is interested only to create a position for himself in order of obtaining his share. One protector sends him, another welcomes him, and his job is guaranteed. By accepting the role of the colonizer, the colonist accepted the responsibility and identity of both himself and the colonizer. It's not like the colonizer who refuses because the colonizer who refuses he rejects colonialism, but he is uh, in a liminal position. Okay, so either a full colonizer, and of course he cannot identify himself with the colonized. All the colonized are enter an interracial and necessary economic part of the colony. The colonizer must disown the colonized and defend his identity, identity both intellectually and physically. He must accept the violence and poverty he sees daily. It's his job to rationalize, to rationalize sorry, the actions of himself and fellow colonialists because he needs to absolve or to pardon himself of the atrocities committed in the name of economic and cultural superiority. Here I have a quotation. This man, a colonizer, perhaps a warm friend and affectionate father who is in his native country, so perhaps social by his social conditions, his family environment, and his natural uh, friendships could have been a democrat, will surely, will surely sort of be transformed into a conservative, reactionary, or even colonial fascist. He cannot help but approve discrimination and codification of injustice. He will be delighted at police, torture, and in, if the necessary uh, if necessity arises, will become guarantees of the necessity of massacre. The contradiction of his lifestyle, even with the economic benefits and cultural justification, take a tool on his side. Okay? It is at this point that he creates the image of the colonialist as a humanitarian who just has to get economic benefits. If, in his eyes, okay, he is bringing civilization to the savages. This is how he absorbed himself, how he pardons the massacres and the sight of the colonized. Okay, for him, for him, he, is, he said he will say that I will bring the civilization to the savages. Of course, this is not the case. Yes. Okay. So for the colonized, I move to the colonized. Okay, as the other. Uh, Post-colonial uh, theories, the colonizer is always viewed in a negative uh, way, which means that images of negation they became what uh, they become what we call a myth. <coughs> the colonizer is always someone who is backward, who is weak, who is uh, okay, evil, wicked, and so on. Okay, so and the, uh, for Albert Mimi, the most prevalent image is that of the laziness of the native, the laziness of the native and his dirtiness, uh, dirtiness, laziness, okay, uh, backwardness, even all of them are uh, found in all colonial I mean, texts. Okay, so this is for the theory. For practice,
This is an application. Okay, I have tried to uh, to give a reading to the Lassina, to Lassina. Okay. Okay. So here we have two uh, two types of characters. We have the colonizer who accepts and the colonizer who refuses. So the colonizer who accepts. Okay. So here we have the character of Claude Jolie. Claude Jolie and Michel Botry, both of them are characters. I mean, young characters who went to Algeria, okay, taking or bearing in mind that they are going to their land. Is it on their land? Is it on, so for, for the French, Algeria is, uh, uh, is a possession, is what we call la plus grande France. Okay, so they go there in order to have a brilliant future. Okay, so for, for Claude Julie, he exemplifies the colonizer who accepts how. He has what we call entrepreneurial uh, spirit. He is realist and ambitious and pragmatic. He wants to succeed against all odds. He embraces and adopts the system. He justifies everything in the system and its practices. And he accepts the violence and massacre against the colonizers. On the other hand, we have the colonizer who refuses. Okay, uh, exemplified in the character Michel uh, Botry. He is weak, emotional, passive, and is indecisive. He is trapped in humanitarian romanticism. Okay, so how? He is unable to take part in the colonial life to assume his uh, new position as a colonialist. He is solidarity with the peasants. His sympathy with the persecuted Jews. His refusal to ally with anti semit and his withdrawal from candidacy as the defeat of Algiers. A sensitivity and sense of justice. And we have another character who is religious, okay, he is Monsignor Tulik. Uh, so this character embodies the hypocrisy of the white man burden, uh, burden, how the church is uh, no longer uh, religious or it, has, it doesn't serve the religious purpose, but it, it serves what we call la mission civilisatrice, okay, which means that for the church the ends justify the means. Okay. And then we have the colonized, the depiction of the colonized in the novel. So many images are associated, uh, are given to the natives, the, Al the Algerians, okay? These images became a myth. In the betrayal text, the natives are absent, okay? They are devout boys, they don't exist as characters. The very reference to them is made on purpose of accentuating their backwardness and the commands to security both physically and intellectually. You have images of laziness, dirtiness, weakness, treachery, theft, backwardness. All of them are meant to be constitutional in the very nature of the colonize. Whatever effort is made, they remain the same. The inhumanity of the colonize is further maintained by what, we, what Albert Mimi say uh, calls depersonalization through the remark of the plural. Okay, so the native or the born colonial writers, they don't exist as he or she, but as they. They are this, they are that. Okay, they don't consider him as an individual. As individual. And the assimilation of the native is nonsense. Okay, he cannot be like the colonizer. The, like the colonizer. So his assimilation is impossible. So, as a conclusion, so through my reading of uh, last scene, uh, I have tried to shed light on uh, an important aspect of the uh, post-colonial theory as devised by Albert Mini. I have, this is of course my personal, I insist on the this, my personal reading, okay, because the works of uh, Louis Bertrand, okay, uh, they are not now in our universities. Is it okay? So this is my own reading of the novel, and I have tried to apply the, the, the Albert Mimi's, uh, I mean, definitions on the theory. Okay, thank you. Uh, so much.